Alright, here we go. So welcome back. Today we are going to be generating nutrition facts tables with Esha. And there will be some more follow-up videos, but I wanted to just jump in and start making some um, nutrition facts tables with you. And so do make sure to watch the previous videos about the um, regulatory principles behind nutrition facts tables in Canada. But uh, Part of it is just let's make some and we'll start to see some of the um, some of the regulations at work once we start generating them. So today at the end of this video, you will be able to describe the process of generating an NFT using the ESHA database software and we'll collect the information for a benchtop product development necessary for generating an NFT and we'll enter a basic recipe into the ESHA software. And at that point, we'll see some of the the fun nuances of what ESHA can do and what ESHA um, can can get people into trouble with if we don't pay attention to some of the, the little details going along. So I'm going to take you a little, uh, uh, just a quick reminder, we're referring back to the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry and do watch that video as well if you haven't already. The Guide to Food Labeling for Industry is where we're getting our regulatory guidance for how to do nutrition labeling. So that's published by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and do watch that video if you haven't already. Um, again, most foods need uh, nutrition facts tables. Not all foods require them, but most foods do. And they have to be done in a very specific format. And the benefit of using a software package like ESHA is that um, the software developers have gone through and read the regulations inside and out and they've got regulatory specialists, they've got computer programmers and they make sure that they're interpreting the regulations um, with a high level of detail. Things like the font and the spacing and the, um, the borders and all of these minor details are absolutely required by, uh, by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency within your label and using a software package will help just uh, smooth over all of those minor nuances. You you totally, as a if you have a graphic design background, you totally could craft this yourself. And in the food and drugs regulation and in the guidance documents provided by the food inspection agency, they will tell you which fonts and which spacing and um, exactly the how many points each letter has to be. Um, in terms of height, I highly recommend just using a software package. The grief that you can save is so much better. Um, and honestly, uh, learning the software packages is an important employability skill. I see uh, using Genesis uh, software or ESHA software uh, very frequently for R&D type positions, product development positions, regulatory positions in food companies. So uh, let's go on a little journey. I'm going to take you through making my breakfast today because, hey, I might as well uh, do a bit of a demo. Normally this class would be an in-person class and we would have a lab component and we would do this together. So first off, just note, I wrote out my recipe. I should be keeping a notebook or I should be keeping my recipe in um, a spreadsheet. And we talked about this before. And just for the purposes of moving along quickly, I just scribbled it on a scrap piece of paper, but do set yourself up with a, a consistent way of keeping documents of your recipes, whether that is a notebook or a spreadsheet um, that you can maintain your recipes and be able to track them back and forth. So I've got it written out. I've got it written out as a household recipe, but hey, check it out. I've got my scale and I'm going to be weighing everything as I'm going along. So as I'm adding each ingredient, I know how much each ingredient um, is contributing to my recipe. Something that I should do, and I, I know that I didn't do it until later, is that I should note the tear weight or the empty weight of my bowl. And we, we call it a tear weight, T-A-R-E. That tear weight is helpful at a later point if, if for some reason I have not paid attention, I can uh, subtract the weight of my bowl from my recipe so that I know what's going on. So 
Let's jump forward to my next one. Oh, wait a second. Can I tear away other things? As I'm whipping my eggs, you'll note it's stuck to the beater. And um, at a later point in time, is this going to mess up my recipe? No, absolutely. I can tear the weight of any other thing. So if I'm working with a, a stand mixer and I've got a dough hook or um, other things, it, it just uh, tear weight of the materials, the, the, the bowls, the pots that I'm working from is extremely helpful. I'm tracking the weight of every ingredient as I'm going along and each ingredient I'm adding tracking that weight and keeping a note of it in my notebook. Then I've got my mix. Hey, today it looked like we were making pancakes and we're actually making a Danish able skivers. So shout out to my friend Rita who taught me about able skivers. And so I've got my mix ready to go, followed my recipe. But here's a question. Wait a second. What happens if I'm using something like a processing aid? In this case, I was brushing each of the holes in my able skiver pan to make sure that they didn't stick. And what I should be doing is weighing the pan before I add the, before I add the um, nonstick, in this case it's clarified butter, and then after I can then get a really good estimate of how much butter, clarified butter, I'm adding to each of those wells because it's going to be picked up by my recipe. What I could also do to really have high level of accuracy is when I pour my uh, batter into the hole, I could weigh the weight of that batter going in because I am likely going to have some evaporative losses during the frying of my able skivers. So these little details, the more that... Uh, the more that you research, the more that you'll want to start to capture these minor details to accurately represent your recipe. Let's move forward again. Oh, so I pour the batter into the holes and I'm going along and flipping these little dough. You can you can find other YouTube videos about how to make able skivers, but you pour the dough in and then you flip it slowly, slowly, slowly until they turn into nice golden brown balls. And then they're ready to serve. Except wait a second, what is a serving size? And that serving size, we'll talk about this more in a second video, but in the case of an able skiver, because it's a non-standard food and you could say, well, is it a breakfast and you eat a whole plate of them? Is it a snack? The nice thing about many foods is that you can define the serving size based off of what you think a, a, a realistic serving is. And in this case, um, we decided that it was going to be a snacking item and we'd put three in that snack. But we'll note in a moment here, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency actually has some recommended serving sizes for food products if you do not have a set serving. So let's say you're not a restaurant and you're always serving three able skewers. If you do not have a reference serving, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency can give you a sense of what that reference serving is. This is a, a whole separate topic for a second discussion. How do you set what a serving size is? Because there's there's a bit of nuance and a bit of regulation behind it. But for all intents and purposes, I'm going to say my serving size is 84 grams or three able skivers. Just to just to note, we'll have a we'll we'll have a discussion about this regulation defining serving sizes and reference amounts for a variety of different products and. In prepackaged products, there's all sorts of different rules about how this is presented. From a um, plated product, I'm going to say it's three pieces. So I got my recipe, and we did a video on this before, taking a recipe and converting it from a household measure into a formula. I didn't put in my butter for nonstick because I'm going to adjust that as I build out my recipe. But I've got my formula here. And I've weighed everything out. And so it's time now to jump into our ESHA software. So pardon me, I'm uh, going to just jump right out here. There's a whole set of instructions on how to access Splashtop. So I'm just, I, I'm not going to rehash all of the how to access Splashtop. Please watch that video separately if you are in the uh, first time accessing Splashtop. I'm going to log in here. And... All right, let's log in. You can sing the Jeopardy song here, but uh, Able Skivers, if, if you've never had them before, they are a traditional dish from Denmark, 
and they are very much just a pancake type recipe, but they're fun and uh, very commonly served in the wintertime, often at Christmas. It takes a bit of time and a bit of effort to uh, make them because as you can see, they're a bit labor intensive. You have to sit and turn them meticulously over and over and over again. But uh, they are fun. They're delicious. My kid likes to eat them with maple syrup. Um, they're traditionally served with applesauce or apple butter. But um, I just had some fun and thought that you could have some fun along with me as I make these able skewers. So the first time you log into uh, Splashtop, it does take a little bit of time. It's way better than the VM whereas before. So you can see the screen. I have to imagine I just logged into a computer in the library at Niagara College and I'm going to click on the Genesis R&D. It's going to ping all sorts of messages here. But uh, it'll warm up as we go along here. Fantastic. So I'm going to blow this up. Uh, pardon. I, I do highly recommend using a screen that is as big as possible because the fonts are a little bit small. So I wouldn't recommend trying to do this on a handheld, uh, handheld device. I would recommend getting a laptop or a desktop with a larger monitor. So file, new recipe. And A E B L E S K I V E R, able skiver. And for now, I'm not going to worry about what my, actually, I do know what my serving size is. A serving size was, let's remind ourselves, 84 grams. We can go back and adjust this. So at a later point, we can make, make, uh, changes to the serving size depending on those reference serving allowances from the CFIA or we could change our packaging. So I'm sure you've seen it before where a food company adjusts the gram weight of a product because they're changing packaging. You can go back and change it no problem. Some of these codes will save for another day or I might just ignore them for now but I just want to I want to show you how from a basics perspective, it's quite straightforward to get in there and get stuff done. So first off, we had eggs. So I'm gonna type eggs into that little box there. Now, you do have to pay attention because you can't just pick the first thing that comes up. And I always love to use eggs as my first example. When I type eggs into the database, the first thing that comes up, and you can see that there is ant eggs. and this is a traditional thing to eat in a number of countries. It's common in the Philippines. It's common in Mexico. Um, it's, it's not, it, and it, it's exactly as you think. It is ants. The six-legged creepy crawly insect on the ground, it lays eggs and they can be harvested as eggs. That is not what we want. So do make sure to pay attention to what you're picking. Burbot eggs, the second one in here, Burbot eggs, is, um, burbot is a type of fish. And so this is more like a type of caviar. It is not eggs, as in chicken eggs. We need to make sure that we're picking the right thing. And so we've got eggs benedict is the third one down. Something that I want to show you, if I click on supplier, sometimes the supplier is coming up as actual companies. And the data that is here has been submitted to a large repository database. And in some cases, it will be the company who's supplying it. So Aramark has their stock recipe, scrambled eggs with cheese. Dairy Queen has their country platter with eggs in it. What I want to do is find either Health Canada's database or the United States Department of Agriculture's database, USDA. Their ARS database or their SR legacy database is going to give the, the standard reference for what we want here. But what's interesting is I scroll through here, Health Canada, when I type in eggs, let's see, I've got scrambled eggs, eggs Benedict, nope. I'm wondering if I need to just type egg. Let's see what happens if I type egg, enter. More than 400 items, that's okay. And I'm gonna click on supplier 
and see if I can find Health Canada's database. Nope, so I'm going to go, uh, was it Canadian records? Nope, so I'm going to go to USDA. USDA standard reference. Let's see if they've got egg. Yes, so good. We've got, finally we've got egg. Egg raw. Now, note I had egg whites and egg yellows. I keep calling them yellows. When I was a kid, I, I grew up in a French family and eggs were eggs yellows. So do we have egg white? Egg white raw? Yes. So I'm going to select and I had 68 grams. So 68 and picking from this list, 68 grams. Okay. Next, egg. If I organize it by supplier and I go to the USDA, then I had egg yolks, not egg yellows. Egg yolk raw select and I had 40 grams. What was next? I had sugar. Supplier. In this case, I am, again, I'm going to look for United States Department of Agriculture. I know you're going to say, but wait a second, we're in Canada. There's a reason why the USDA is the preferred database. One, they have compiled literally hundreds of thousands of ingredients and they have invested much more heavily in their database than the Canadians have. We do have a database in Canada, but just in all fairness, our database only contains thousands of items, whereas the American one contains hundreds of thousands. And everyone in North America uses the USDA database. Just take my word for it. So I'm going to select sugar white granulated. And that was 15 grams. When I have it all in gram units, it makes it so much easier. Then I had baking powder. Baking powder. In this case, I did know that it was from ACH Food. That was the magic brand. But again, I could be consistent and stick with USDA. If I'm worried about not being able to see it, I can run those lines over. Select. How much was it? It was baking powder was four grams. Baking soda. Nice and easy. Select. That was one gram. You get to a point where you can do it quickly and I'm actually going tab eight. Salt. Salt table. Select. And that was two. Tab eight grams. Enter. What was next? Flour. I typed in flour AP. And I may have all purpose. Let's try that again. So flour all purpose, I have to read a little bit more details. Flour all purpose, self rising enriched. No, flour all purpose, white bleached enriched. This would be Flour all-purpose white bleached enriched, select, and that was 306 grams. Again, uh, if, you, if you did the previous slideshow, if I typed in one cup or two cups, which was the original household measure, it's going to be slightly different. We know that one cup, if I'm measuring it one day, is going to be different weight to weight, but a weight is going to be consistent day to day to day. This is why I stress, it's important to measure things by weight because you're going to be more consistent. 
you did see in there that I could have entered, uh, I could have entered cups, but it would have given me a very different weight. Let's just try that actually, uh, just for fun. Flower, all purpose. What happens if I do that? Select. And I had two cups. I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to jump ahead here and I'm going to show you reports, spreadsheet. If I click on this spreadsheet, it's going to show me, I'm going to blow that up so you can see it. In this case, The weight, despite the fact that it should be the same, that by weight, the original all-purpose flour that I put in by weight gave me 37.47 grams per serving. When I put it in by cups and it divided it out, it says it's 30.6 grams per serving. And that's why, again, as fast as you possibly can move things to weight, it's going to be more accurate. Do not use cups. Let me jump back. I'm going to go back to home, edit, view, database. No, I'm going to recipe. So let's, I'm going to close the spreadsheet here, go back to my recipe. I don't want that ingredient. I put in an ingredient that I don't want. I can just click on delete it. With the delete button, am I sure I want to delete it? Yes. So what else do I need? Milk. Milk. And that was 2%. Milk 2%. Okay. In this case, you see it is showing up as the Health Canada Canadian Nutrient File. I'll put that one in just for fun. Select. And I had 480 grams. Tab 8. Last but not least, I had butter unsalted. Do watch your spelling. I just uh, would have likely had a product not show up because I would I had written unslatted and spelled it incorrectly. Butter unsalted select. And I am going to adjust that to 50 and 8 grams. For now, I'm not going to worry about the, the two grams per ball or approximately six grams per recipe that I would be adding as a non-stick agent in the pan. For now, I'm going to stick to the recipe as is and run it. So this is where I always, uh, when I teach this in person, I always have the students say, drum roll, please. And I go, ta -ta 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 and I make them drum on their desk, but if I go up to this button that says view label, I can click on that and boom, there's my label. And that's it. Now, first and foremost, I do need to take a look and see, wait a second, my allergens are not correct. That's just silly. Why do I have crustaceans in here and egg and fish and gluten? I can go in and adjust my allergen statement by clicking here. And you'll note that the default in Esha is always that everything is in my allergen list. I do need to go through and use some basic common sense. There's no crustaceans in there. I'm going to click, yeah, it's it's okay. I'm not, I'm not having an issue with me removing it from everything. Don't show this again. So there is egg in there, there is gluten in there, there is milk in there. Mollusks, no. Mustard, no. Peanut, no. Sesame seeds, no. Shellfish, no. Soy, no. Tree nuts, no. Whoops, I unclicked wheat. There is definitely wheat in there. Nice. So now my allergen statement is correct. You do have to do that manually, but if you're in a company that has uh, tracking on different allergens and different ingredients, you can automate it so that let's say, for example, your wheat flour, if your wheat flour had a may contain soy, statement, um, that's what we call a component um, nth degree allergen, and that com that allergen um, would carry over to your product so that you would have to have a may contain soy statement yourself. 
Now up here on the ingredients, we do need to do some cleanup on these ingredients. It's a whole separate discussion, but for now, what we do note about these ingredients is that they have been put into the recipe in order by weight. And in the listing of ingredients, there are some fun um, regulations. And again, those are in the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. Some things can be moved to the very, very end. Some things can be grouped together like spices. And so that is its own different discussion. We also have to convert some things to plain language. So we don't You've likely never in your uh, time reading labels ever seen 2% milk or where it says flour, all-purpose, white, bleached, enriched. You have to go through and manually clean up those ingredients. And in some cases, you have to go through and list component ingredients as well. We'll have a second discussion about this, but that was pretty cool that it really didn't take us too, too long to generate our first nutrition facts table for this product. So it's got 170 calories, it's got six grams fat. Well, what we should note is that it's actually six grams, but we had to add an additional approximately two grams per, per round ball. So it, that's actually going to be pushed up to 12, but I, I'm, I'm gonna save that adjustment for another day. Saturated fat is at three grams, trans fat at 0.2 grams. Whoa, wait a second. You may be saying, wait, we just, in the previous slideshow, we said trans fat's bad, let's get rid of trans fat. Where's the trans fat coming from? This is a unique feature in ESHA, and this is something that as product developers, you may be really excited about because you may send that nutrition deck off to marketing and advertising or to your label design group. And pardon me, my, my spouse just called me on the phone. <laughs> I hung up on him. In that product, they may say, well, we have to have zero trans fat. Where is that trans fat coming from? You can go over to the report section, pull up that spreadsheet, and you can go into each of these individual nutrients and figure out, wait a second, where did the trans fat come from? And so I found the trans fat column here. And where's the trans fat coming from? It's coming from the milk. It's coming from the butter. And if your product development group says, we have to have a zero trans fat declaration, you may be asking, well, do I switch the milk out for a non-fat milk? Do I switch the butter out for a different product? In the case of milk and butter, the trans fat that's there is naturally occurring. It, it comes from the uh, fermentation that goes on in the gut of the, of the, of the cow. And the, the fermentation that's occurring in the rumen of the cow causes trans fat to occur. So you have to ask yourself, do you say naturally occurring trans fat from butter somewhere on the label? Or do you switch that out? These are the sorts of questions that as product developers, Esha can help you out with. Maybe going back to our label again, going back to our label, they say, well, you know what? We only have one gram of fiber. And going back to the spreadsheet here, where's that fiber coming from? So total fiber, we've got a very small amount. And note, you're going to say, wait a second, on the label it says one gram, one gram of fiber, but on the spreadsheet it said 0 0.72. There are a lot of different rounding rules that contribute to what you're seeing. And that's all outlined in the guide for food labeling for industry. But the nice thing about using a software package is it's going to apply those rounding rules automatically for you so that you don't have to fuss about them. That said, we'll take some time and, and dig into them at a later point. I wanted, uh, the biggest outcome for today was that I wanted you to see that it isn't that onerous to generate your first label and then to start to read it and think about opportunities where you might be wanting to improve your recipe. So at this point, if you want to save your file, you could save 
you could save to file. And as you remember from the, the sh uh, slideshow about uh, working in Splashtop, you can save it to your OneDrive and it will save as an EXL file. You can save it in your OneDrive as an EXL file. And then the nice thing is, if you were to send that EXL file to me, I could open it in my Splashtop and I could read it in Esha again. EXL files can only be read in Esha. They are database driven files. I could read it because I have access to Esha, but if you were to send it to your grandma who maybe doesn't work in Esha, she wants to make able skivers and know the nutritional quality, she wouldn't be able to open it. If you wanted to save that file in a form that uh, you could uh, share, you'd save it and uh, print to PDF. But print to PDF, it's going to save it as a PDF file. So again, save it in your OneDrive and it will save your, save your PDF there. So we made our first nutrition label. It was not as tricky as we thought. You do need to pay attention to some of these minor details. It is important to not uh, neglect those minor, minor little things, but it's not, it's not as tricky as you think. And I think you are totally capable at this point to start generating some labels yourself. All right, feel free to ask me questions as you're going along and try it out. It's, it's fun. Take care and we'll talk to you soon. Oh, and make sure to disconnect your splash top when you're all done using the disconnect button. Disconnect. All right. <laughs>